Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Reynolds, and I am the Urban Trees Initiative Coordinator with the City of Ann Arbor's Office of Sustainability and Innovations. Today, I'd like to take you on a virtual tour of some of the trees found here in our city of Ann Arbor. To follow along with this presentation, or to explore the virtual tree tour at your own pace, you can open the Google Map version of the tree tour. This is available on our webpage at www.a2gov.org slash 10 trees. A video recording of this presentation will also be available on the same webpage. For each tree that we go through in this tree tour, I'd like to give you some key ID features so you can learn how to identify the tree, some fun facts about the tree, and then show you an example of the tree growing right here in the city of Ann Arbor. So let's start off with the red maple. So the red maple uh, has medium sized leaves that have three to five irregularly toothed lobes on them. So when we're talking about lobes in terms of tree leaves, we're talking about parts that uh, stick out from the rest of the leaf. So you can see here with this red maple leaf that this one has about three lobes. Um, when we mentioned that it's a regularly toothed, what that means is that you can see the edge of the leaf here has this kind of jagged edge to it. Now, the petiole of a leaf is this part here. So it's the part that connects the leaf itself to the stem, um, the branch on the tree. And on red maples, this petiole is, uh, has a reddish color to it. Now, the other thing with red maples to keep an eye out for is the seeds. So the seeds are in what we call samaras, which are essentially just winged fruits. Uh, and so with the red maple, you can see that you have these, uh, some people call them helicopter seeds or whirly gigs. Uh, they're in this horseshoe shape. Um, and if you, they fall from the tree or if you pick them up off the ground and throw them up in the air, then you can see they kind of do like a whirly gig uh, twirling helicopter motion as they move through the air. So uh, some fun facts about this tree. Uh, this species has the greatest north-south range of any tree species in eastern North America. So you can find red maples all the way from Newfoundland up in Canada down to southern Florida. So it has a really large range. Uh, and then the largest known red maple in existence is in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park uh, down in Tennessee. And it is about seven feet in diameter. So while we don't have any seven foot diameter red maples here in Ann Arbor, we do have some great examples. So if we go to this one in the Allen neighborhood and take a look at it on Google Maps to the virtual tree tour, you can see it has kind of a generic uh, tree shape to it. Uh, if you zoom in, you can see the kind of grayish bark uh, that the maples have. And you can also see the, uh, the lobes that are on the leaves. It's a little hard to tell uh, from this distance but uh, there are lots of red maples in our city that you can go out and take a look at in person. So moving on now to a related tree, the sugar maple. So how can you identify the sugar maple? Well, uh, again, we're gonna see those medium sized leaves, uh, but these are going to have definitively five lobes. So you can see one, two, three, four, five lobes on these leaves. Uh, the margins of these leaves, so the edges, also are not going to be uh, jagged or regularly toothed like the uh, red maple leaves were. Again, you're going to see these uh, horseshoe-shaped helicopter seeds. Um, with the sugar maple, they are slightly larger and wider than with the red maple. Uh, and you're going to see gray bark on the tree with some deep furrows in it. So a fun fact about the sugar maple, uh, this is the tree that produces maple syrup or that we get maple syrup from. Um, but the sap uh, from the tree, while it is sweet, it doesn't have the flavor or color of maple syrup when it comes directly out of the tree. Uh, this only happens when uh, people take the sap and boil it or allow it to evaporate and concentrate. So it actually takes about 30 to 50 gallons of sap from a tree to produce just one gallon of maple syrup. So if we go and look at a sugar maple here uh, in the uh, Germantown neighborhood of Ann Arbor on our virtual tree tour, 
you can see again that kind of generic shape that maples have. Um, the gray furrowed bark is pretty evident in this example. Uh, and if you're able to zoom in further uh, on your own with the tree tour, you might be able to see those uh, lobed leaves with the five lobes. Um, moving in a little bit closer here, uh, you can see perhaps a little bit better those leaves uh, that have those lobes. So now we move on to yet another maple. Uh, this one is the silver maple. So this one has slightly larger leaves uh, than either of the other two maple species we've talked about. And it, uh, again, like the sugar maple, it has five lobes. So you can see them here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, these have relatively narrow sinuses. So the sinuses are the areas between lobes on a leaf. So you can see uh, that it, with the silver maple, those are relatively narrow uh, gaps in between those lobes. So you kind of get this feathery appearance to the leaves with the silver maple. Um, with silver maple leaves, the underside of the leaf is also slightly silvery, um, whereas the top is a little bit deeper, darker green. And the helicopter or whirly gig seeds that you get from the silver maples are much larger than with either the red maple or the sugar maple. So a fun fact about this tree, uh, when the leaves begin to appear in the spring, the sap from maple trees is no longer usable for syrup. Um, because most of those sugars that are in the sap are going towards the leaf production. So silver maples can technically be used for syrup, but since they leaf out earlier than sugar maples, so the leaves uh, appear on silver maples earlier in the spring than with, um, or sorry, they appear earlier with silver maples than with sugar maples, uh, the silver maple is pretty impractical to use for large-scale production of maple syrup because you can't uh, get that sweet sap from these trees for as long as you can with the sugar maples. So if we take a look at our example silver maple in the city, it is down here again in the Allen neighborhood. Lots of great maples down in that neighborhood. So here is our example, silver maple. Uh, this one is pretty old and large, as you can see. It's got a pretty large diameter trunk. Um, and take a look at it. You can kind of see that silveriness of the leaves in the fact that uh, the, uh, the leaves are a little bit less green from a distance uh, than with some of the other maples that we've already looked at. And you can see those kind of feathery uh, lobes also in the leaves. So now we're going to move on from our maples and take a look at some of the oaks that we have in the city. So the first oak I want to go over is the bur oak. So bur oaks, um, well, most oaks uh, really, have leaves that have lobes on them, again, like the maple leaves. Uh, but with oak leaves, the you can see that the leaf is longer than it is wide. Uh, and so those lobes come out along the sides of the leaf, um, unlike with the maple, where it's kind of more of a star shape. So with a bur oak, you have five to nine lobes on the leaves. Uh, and you're going to see a pair of relatively deep sinuses about halfway along the length. So you can see on this one, there's a deep one here and a deep one here about halfway along the length of the leaf. Uh, you're also going to see relatively large acorns, which are the fruits of oak trees. Uh, and the acorns on the bur oak are going to have fringed or hairy caps. So you can kind of see in this drawing that the acorn has uh, some hair along the cap here. Um, which is the top part of the acorn, uh, between the cap and the, uh, the body or the rest of the acorn. So a fun fact about the bur oak, this is one of the most tolerant oaks to urban conditions. Uh, so this species is particularly common in cities across the U.S., uh, and it actually is the tree that appears on the seal of the city of Ann Arbor. So if we look at our example, Bur Oak, uh, here, it is up in the Water Hill neighborhood of Ann Arbor. Um, and so you can see this is a pretty large, uh, healthy uh, example of the tree. Um, zoom in a little bit and you can kind of start to see those lobed leaves. Uh, you see that typical oak uh, structure um, to the tree where you have this really big canopy. Um, which is the, the leafy part of the tree. Uh, there you can see this is a pretty old big diameter tree, uh, and you can see the lobes on the leaves a little bit better um, from up close here. So now we move on to another species of oak. This is going to be the white oak. 
So with the white oak, you see, again, these leaves uh, that have lobes on them. They have 7 to 11 lobes, uh, but they are more rounded lobes. So you can see that you have these round, not very sharp lobes on the white oak leaf. Uh, and uh, pretty much all of the sinuses, so the areas between the lobes, are going to be relatively deep. So they're going to get pretty close to the center of that leaf. Uh, with white oaks, you're also going to see smaller acorns than you did with fir oaks, uh, and the caps are going to be shallow. So you can see that the body of the acorn is pretty large compared to the size of the cap or the top part of the acorn. So a fun fact about white oaks uh, is that white oak wood is especially watertight, so it's long been favored for shipbuilding, uh, as well as making barrels to hold wine and whiskey and other liquids uh, because they don't leak out through the wood as easily as with some other types of wood. So if we take a look at our example white oak, it is in the... Um, uh, Old West side, or Old West neighborhood of Ann Arbor. Uh, if we go into Google Maps and take a look, uh, again, you see that really large canopy um, that you get with many oak species. Uh, the branches go out pretty far from the trunk of the tree. Uh, you can see, again, this is a relatively large diameter uh, tree, uh, this individual, um, with those long, large branches uh, and those uh, rounded lobed leaves. So now we'll talk about the northern red oak. Uh, this oak has, again, 7 to 11 lobes on it, uh, but this being a red oak has more pointed lobes than the white oak did. Uh, and you're also going to see these uh, kind of spine tips on the lobes. Um, so that is actually the veins um, in the leaf, which are the, uh, they carry the sugars and nutrients and water and other things through the leaf. Uh, those veins actually kind of stick out a little bit past the edge of the leaf, uh, creating that tip, uh, that spine tip on these red oak leaves. Again, you're going to see relatively small acorns. These are going to have shallow caps, just like with the white oak, um, but they're going to be a little bit more rounded um, than the white oak acorns, which were a little bit longer than they were wide. So the acorns of the red oak are a favorite food for lots of different wildlife species, uh, including blue jays, wild turkeys, squirrels, white-tailed deer, raccoons, and black bears. Uh, acorns are actually also edible by humans. Uh, you just have to prepare them correctly because uh, all oaks um, and the acorns include um, a chemical called tannins, uh, which is slightly toxic um, if it is not properly removed uh, by boiling or otherwise treating the acorns. So let's take a look at a northern red oak here in Ann Arbor. So we're going to zoom in to the upper Water Hill neighborhood of Ann Arbor to take a look at this tree. Again, you see that pretty wide branching structure. This one's not quite as big as the others. So it's got some more trees around it, keeping it a little bit narrower, but it's still got a pretty wide uh, branching structure. Uh, and if we move a little bit closer, you can zoom in on the leaves and you can take a look at them and see that they have those uh, kind of pointed lobes with the bristle tips, which you may not be able to see through here. Um, but if you find one in person, uh, find a leaf, you'll definitely be able to see those. All right, so that covers our oaks here in Ann Arbor. Uh, now I want to move on to the black walnut. So the black walnut has really large leaves. Um, so this actually is all one leaf. It may look like several leaves, but it is one leaf. Um, so what we call this is a pinnately compound leaf. So basically compound just means that there are multiple leaflets, which look like leaves, that make up the actual full leaf. Uh, and pinnately just means that it looks kind of like a feather. Um, so you can see that we have 15 to 23 finely toothed leaflets. So if you look at the edges of the leaflets, they are kind of jagged, um, that make up this one large compound leaf. Uh, with the black walnut, you're also going to see some large uh, green fleshy fruits, uh, and those contain the black shelled nut inside uh, that we actually eat uh, walnuts. 
So a fun fact about the black walnut is that the roots of this tree can actually release a compound that is toxic to many other plant species, including fruit trees, chestnuts, pines, azaleas, rhododendrons, hydrangeas, blueberries, blackberries, tomatoes, potatoes, cabbages, peas, peppers, a whole bunch of different plants. Um, so this tree actually releases that compound in order to reduce competition around it um, to, and prevent other uh, vegetation from growing and using uh, the water and other resources that the black walnut wants to use. So let's take a look at a black walnut here in our city. So this is actually gonna be north of the river. Uh, we're going to zoom in and take a look at it on Google Maps. Um, so you can see this one is kind of out by itself, probably a good thing because of that uh, compound it releases. Uh, and even from this distance, you can see those really large feathery looking leaves, um, those pinnately compound leaves that I mentioned. Um, so looking up at the canopy, those are particularly uh, evident um, with those little leaflets making up those larger uh, individual leaves, as you can see there. All right, uh, moving on to another tree with a nut, uh, we're going to talk about the shagbark hickory. So hickories also have these pinnately compound leaves. So you can see this is one leaf with multiple leaflets. Uh, they're relatively large also, uh, but they do have less leaflets uh, than the walnut did. So with the shagbark hickory, you're going to have five to seven leaflets. Again, you're going to see these fleshy fruits uh, with the hickory. They are kind of four sections, so you can see the, the lines dividing it into four sections. Uh, and inside, you're going to find that shelled hickory nut. Uh, the bark on shagbark hickories, uh, as you might guess from the name, uh, actually takes on a shaggy appearance. So it starts to peel um, and have that shaggy look to it. So a fun fact about this tree is that the nut of the shagbark hickory can actually be used as a substitute for pecans or pecans, however you want to say that. Uh, and so the tree actually frequently hybridizes with the pecan tree. Um, so you can get uh, kind of a hybrid between a hickory and a pecan. So if we zoom in to a shagbark hickory up here in the Abbott neighborhood of Ann Arbor and take a look at that, uh, you can see um, kind of that shaggy bark even from this distance. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit more, it's a little more evident. Uh, and you can see, again, those relatively large uh, pinnately compound feathery looking leaves. Um, so if we move a little bit closer, that shaggy bark uh, becomes even more evident looking at it. All right, um, so another hickory that we have here in Ann Arbor is the bitter nut hickory. Uh, so this is going to, again, have those pinnately compound leaves. Uh, these are going to have seven to 11 leaflets, and they're going to be uh, kind of lance-shaped is the, um, how we describe this. So these are really uh, long, narrow uh, leaves with pointed tips. Uh, the leaves are going to have a slightly yellowish underside with the bitter nut hickory. Um, and again, we're going to see that fleshy four-section fruit, just like we did on the shagbark hickory, um, and it will contain, again, a shelled nut. Uh, so this species is one of only a few members of the hickory genus that has inedible nuts. Um, so humans cannot consume the bitter nut hickory. Uh, it is bitter, as the name implies. Um, but the wood from the bitternut hickory is frequently used to smoke meat. So if you've ever heard of hickory smoked uh, pork or salmon or what have you, um, a lot of times that uses wood from the bitternut hickory tree. All right, so let's take a look at our bitternut hickory here in Ann Arbor. This is going to be down in the Almondinger Heights neighborhood. Um, so you can see, even from this distance, again, those uh, pinnately compound leaves, kind of being a kind of a feathery look to the canopy of the tree. Um, if we move in a little bit closer, you can see that the bark is not shaggy like it was with the shagbark hickory, so that's a distinguishing factor between the two species. Uh, and looking up at the canopy, you can see those leaves with those lance-shaped leaflets that I talked about. All right, so we're going to move on from trees that have nuts as their fruit to trees that have what is more traditionally considered a fruit um, or a 
berry in this case. So that is the white mulberry. Uh, with the white mulberry, you see relatively small leaves that have, uh, again, a serrated or slightly toothed, jagged edge to them. Uh, but what's really interesting about the leaves of the mulberry and makes it really easy to identify is that you can see multiple different shapes of leaf on the same tree. So you have egg-shaped leaves like this one here. You can have midden-shaped leaves, um, so they look kind of like Michigan. Uh, and then you also have leaves that have three to five lobes on them. Uh, the fruits of the white mulberry are clusters of berry-like structures. Um, they are very sweet and tasty. Uh, they can range in color from white to actually dark purple. Uh, this species is actually native to China and is considered invasive across most of North America, unfortunately. Uh, but there is a native uh, version uh, called the red mulberry, um, which is much less common, uh, but is very similar in appearance uh, and has the same uh, tasty fruits. Um, they are slightly different colors sometimes, but they're just as delicious, uh, and they are not invasive. They are actually native to the area. So uh, to give you an idea of what mulberries look like, we're going to take a look at a white mulberry, unfortunately, uh, that is growing up in the wines uh, neighborhood of Ann Arbor. Uh, this is a, you can see, a very large example of a mulberry. Most of them are kind of a little more bushy than this, but they can get to this size. Uh, if you zoom in, you can kind of see that uh, light yellowish brownish bark, um, and you can see also those leaves that have multiple shapes to them. Um, you would be able to find all three shapes on this one tree. All right, moving on to another uh, fruiting tree, we have the black cherry. So the black cherry has uh, small, again, finely serrated or toothed leaves um, that have pretty prominent venation. So again, the veins uh, carry the sugars and other water and other things through the leaf. Um, with the black cherry, you can see those veins very easily. Uh, the fruits of the black cherry are small cherries, uh, we all know what cherries look like, uh, that are purplish black when they're ripe. Um, they have clusters of small white flowers that actually have a slightly unpleasant odor to them. And then the bark of the tree, uh, especially younger parts of the tree, um, or in younger trees, uh, have uh, the bark has prominent lenticels forming rings in it. So lenticels are actually just uh, small holes in the bark that allow for gas exchange. So they allow for um, carbon dioxide and oxygen to move in and out uh, through the bark of the tree. Uh, and with black cherries, uh, those lenticels are very prominent and form rings in the bark. Uh, so a fun fact about the black cherry is that the leaves actually contain a compound that is converted to cyanide when the leaf is damaged. Uh, so most herbivores are deterred by this uh, and do not eat these leaves, but tint caterpillars are actually able to tolerate this toxin and even regurgitate it as a defense mechanism against predators. So they munch on these leaves uh, and then they store that cyanide uh, inside of them. And then when something comes and tries to eat them, like a bird, for example, they can actually spit that cyanide out at the bird. Um, so that's a really cool, kind of mildly terrifying, um, not dangerous to humans though, so don't worry, uh, thing about this tree. All right, so if we zoom in and take a look at a black cherry up here in the Water Hill neighborhood, uh, we can see, so this is it over here, this relatively large tree. Um, you can see uh, the bark. Uh, it's got a relatively straight trunk to it. Um, and if we go in a little bit closer, then you may be able to see some of those uh, lenticel rings in the bark if you were to zoom in on some of the younger bark, uh, such as that branch up there. And you can see those uh, finely serrated leaves as well. Uh, now I will really quickly mention um, that the cherries from this tree are not edible for humans. Um, they can contain uh, relatively large amounts of cyanide, um, which of course is poisonous to us. All right, moving on to the hackberry. Uh, so the hackberry has relatively small uh, leaves that are kind of egg-shaped, as you can see here. Uh, they also have an uneven leaf base, so you can see particularly on this uh, leaf here or this one here, that one uh, on one side the leaf base uh, kind of goes up at a sharper angle, and on the other side it is more rounded. 
Uh, you can also see that the veins inside the leaf uh, kind of have a curve to them. The fruits uh, from this tree are berry-like. Um, they're what are called technically droops. Uh, they are deep purple when they ripen, uh, and the older bark on this tree uh, kind of develops a corky texture. So fun fact about this tree, uh, the fruits of the hackberry actually persist late into the winter. Um, so they are particularly popular with many winter bird species like waxwings, cardinals, and robins. All right, so we're going to take a look at our uh, resident hackberry example here in the city. Uh, this is in the Arbor View neighborhood. Uh, so if we take a look at it, uh, here it is right along a, a park here. Uh, you can see uh, that it has a pretty nice uh, branching structure to it. Um, and if you were to zoom in a little bit closer, uh, you might be able to see those egg-shaped leaves. Um, and if you were to take a look at it in person, you could see the curves in the veination uh, and those uneven leaf bases. Uh, this tree is not quite old enough, though, to exhibit that corky bark texture that I mentioned. All right, moving on to the service berries. So service berries have small rounded leaves. The leaves are just about as wide as they are long most of the time, um, although that can vary. And they are usually also toothed, although that can vary as well. Uh, the fruits are small berries, which are deep bluish black when ripe. Uh, and this tree may occur as either a shrub or a small understory tree, uh, depending on the species. So service berry is a group of um, different species that are all in the same uh, genus. Um, the fruits of the service berry are edible to, uh, for humans, uh, and they are quite delicious. They actually taste like a cross between a blueberry and a blackberry. So taking a look at our example service berry here in Ann Arbor, if we zoom in here to uh, kind of near the Burns Park neighborhood uh, and take a look at the tree, you can see this is uh, more of a tree variety rather than a shrub variety. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see those uh, rounded leaves and you can also see the service berries tend to have rather smooth bark. All right, so moving on to another tree with edible fruits, we have the pawpaw. So this tree has uh, pretty easily distinguished uh, long diamond shaped leaves. Uh, they also have large fruits, which are yellowish green, and they have large showy flowers, which are a deep purple. Uh, this occurs usually as a small understory tree. The fruits of the pawpaw are edible for humans also, uh, and they taste like a cross between a banana and a mango. Uh, the uh, inside of the fruit is actually a very custardy texture, um, so the tree is also sometimes called the custard apple because of that. So if we take a look at our pawpaws here in Ann Arbor, there is a good one in the Dickon neighborhood. Um, so we will zoom in and take a look at that. Uh, as you can see, it is a relatively small tree, but it does have those very long uh, kind of diamond shaped leaves that you can see. Unfortunately, no fruit on this one at the moment, um, but you may see them uh, walking around the city. OK, moving on to the American linden. So the American linden has heart shaped leaves uh, that are slightly toothed along the edges. You can see very fine teeth here. Uh, they also have clusters of yellow flowers that hang from long leaf-like bracts. So you can see this long, uh, skinny thing that looks like a leaf um, is actually technically a modified leaf that's kind of more of a petal for the flower, um, that, but the, uh, the showy parts of the flower hang down off of that. Uh, the American linden is also called the American basswood, uh, and the wood from this tree is actually frequently used to make solid body electric guitars because it has really good resonance um, for the sound from those. So if we take a look at an American linden here in Ann Arbor, we're going to scroll into the Germantown Old West Side area uh, and take a look. Uh, you can see this is a very large example of an American linden. Um, pretty old with that uh, furrowed grooved bark uh, and you can kind of see the uh, heart-shaped leaves from here uh, move a little bit closer and take a look at it uh, and if we zoom in on some of the leaves you can actually see those uh, bracts that are kind of hanging off with the flowers dangling from them. 
All right, moving on to the northern catalpa. This also uh, has large heart-shaped leaves. However, the uh, margins or the edges of the leaf are smooth in this case. Uh, the flowers are in clusters of um, white bell-shaped flowers, which are very fragrant. Uh, they have purple and orange stripes. And then this tree also has long seed pods. So the northern catalpa is an important species for pollinators. Its flowers are visited by bees and hummingbirds. Uh, and catalpa trees are also the only host species of the catalpa sphinx moth. Um, so if it weren't for these trees, we wouldn't have this moth species. All right, so let's take a look at a northern catalpa here in Ann Arbor. If we scroll in uh, kind of near downtown and the university campus, we take a look at this catalpa here. Uh, it has been trimmed some for power lines, uh, but you can see those very large heart-shaped leaves on this tree. Uh, if we move a little bit closer and take a look from this angle, uh, you can see again uh, those large heart-shaped leaves, perhaps a little bit better from over here. All right, so moving on to the American elm. With the American elm, uh, we see doubly toothed leaves. Um, so each tooth along the edge of the leaf has its own teeth on it. So it's a very serrated uh, leaf edge. And um, we also see that we have uneven leaf bases. So again, we're seeing um, one in um, one side at the base of the leaf uh, comes out more, um, and then the other side is more curved. Uh, the seeds of this tree come in small winged samara, so you can see there's a seed in the middle with wings on either side. Uh, and these trees also grow in a distinctive vase shape. Uh, so that vase shape actually made this tree really popular with early city planners. Um, so for example, uh, L'Enfant, when he was designing, or designing Washington, D.C., uh, planted a lot of elms along the streets because the elms have that vase shape. Uh, the branches don't uh, go out over the street as much as with some other tree species, making it easier for um, vehicles or back then uh, horse-drawn carriages to pass by. True American elms are now rare uh, due to their susceptibility, unfortunately, to Dutch elm disease. However, many hybrid species uh, that are resistant to this disease have been developed, uh, such as the Acolyte elm and the Jefferson elm, among others. So let's take a look at an elm here in Ann Arbor. Uh, if we zoom in here to the North Burns Park neighborhood, we can take a look at our example elm. Uh, so you see that vase shape with those branches well above uh, where the street is. Um, so not much pruning required to allow vehicles to pass through. Um, you can see all of that branching structure to give it that vase shape. Uh, and you can kind of see those um, leaves with these serrated edges and the uneven leaf bases. If we move in closer, uh, you can still see that vase shape uh, and zoom in a little bit on those leaves there. All right, uh, now we will talk a little bit about the eastern cottonwood. So the eastern cottonwood has triangular leaves, as you can see here, a kind of triangular shape. Uh, the petioles here, so again, that's this bit between the leaf and the branch of the tree, um, are flattened with the eastern cottonwood rather than rounded as they usually are on most other trees. Uh, you see particularly large leaf buds. So this is a leaf bud over here. Um, that is where the leaf will emerge in the spring. Uh, so this species has large leaf buds. Uh, the male flowers are reddish uh, catkins, which would be this here. And the female flowers are yellow in color and are drawn here. Um, so uh, this species is dioecious. Uh, that means that some individuals of the species only have the male flowers and some individuals only have the female flowers. Uh, the female trees produce seeds that are attached to cotton-like fluff um, and that fluff aids in wind dispersal. So the seeds travel further because uh, the air currents kind of catch that cotton and move them further. Uh, and so when these trees release their seeds, it can actually look like it has snowed right underneath of where the tree is because of all of the white cottony fluff that ends up on the ground. All right, so let's take a look at an eastern cottonwood here in Ann Arbor. We're going to look at the southern side of the city in the Bryant-Pattengill East area. 
And here is our cottonwood here. Uh, you can see they get to be very tall trees um, from back here. It's a little difficult to see some of the leaves, uh, but we can move a little bit closer and zoom in some, and you may be able to see um, that the trees are slightly uh, triangular in shape with this cottonwood. All right, so now uh, let's talk a little bit about a river birch. So the river birch, uh, like the cottonwood, can have triangular leaves um, or sometimes more diamond shaped, as you can see here. Uh, they have doubly toothed margins like the elms that we talked about earlier. Uh, they also have very conspicuous catkins. So they have these uh, flowering parts uh, that are very long and dangle from the tree, um, particularly noticeable in the spring before the leaves come out. Uh, the tree bark uh, is reddish and often peeling, uh, and this tree can also come in single or multi-stemmed varieties. So you may see multiple uh, kind of trunks uh, coming up from the ground for this tree. Uh, fun fact, if you boil the sap from a river birch, it produces a sweetener that is very similar to maple syrup. Uh, the species is also very useful in preventing erosion along rivers and streams. So if we take a look at a river birch here in Ann Arbor, we will zoom in here um, to kind of near the Burns Park area again and take a look at this river birch here. So you can see this is a multi-stem variety. So you see uh, two trunks coming up there. I um, mean, you can see these uh, leaves are coming very close to the camera here and you can see that uh, triangular diamond shape to them. All right, uh, now we will talk a little bit about the London plane tree. So the London plane tree has large, very distinctive uh, kind of maple-like leaves, although the sinuses are less present. So it's kind of just, uh, you know, a bunch of points. Um, the sinuses don't go as deep into the leaf like they do with maple leaves generally. Uh, the fruits are about golf ball sized uh, and they're uh, spherical um, and they contain a whole bunch of seeds in there. And then the bark is very easy to notice with the plane tree um, and it's uh, the sycamore, which is related to it. Uh, both of them have mottled scaly bark um, that can be white in places, gray in places, and green in other places. Uh, so the London plane tree is actually a hybrid between the American sycamore, which is native, and the Asian plane tree. Uh, this London plane tree variety, this hybrid between the two, is very well adapted to urban environments, so you see it a lot along city streets. All right, uh, so if we take a look at a London plane tree here in Ann Arbor, we're gonna move down here to the Dickon neighborhood near where the Paul Paul was and take a look at a London plane tree along one of our streets. Uh, so you can see from here, uh, if we zoom in, you see that mottled gray, white, green bark. Um, and if we move a little closer, the bark becomes a little even easier to see from this angle. Uh, it looks kind of like it's wearing camo. Uh, and then you can also see, if we look at the leaves, that they have that distinctive kind of star shape to them like a maple leaf does. All right, uh, so we'll move on now to the Kentucky coffee tree. So the Kentucky coffee tree has large bipinnately compound leaves. So again, a compound leaf means um, that this entire thing uh, is actually one leaf. The bipinnately means that uh, there is one part and then there are leaflets coming off of that part. So it's like a feather with feathers coming off of it. Um, so these are very large compound leaves. Uh, each of these uh, is a leaflet, uh, and the leaflets are usually small and oval shaped. Uh, you're also going to see large reddish brown leathery seed pods on these trees, um, which contain large round seeds. Uh, and those seeds, uh, actually the native peoples of Eastern North America, uh, would roast and ground these seeds uh, to create a hot beverage very similar to coffee. Uh, hence the name of the tree. They also use the seeds in making jewelry and also um, as dice in games that they played. So if we take a look at an example, Kentucky coffee tree in Ann Arbor, we're gonna go up here again to the north side, uh, right by that black walnut that we looked at earlier. 
and we are going to see this Kentucky coffee tree here. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see those very large leaves with the very small leaflets that make them up. Uh, you can also see that Kentucky toffee trees can become very tall trees um, and very large as well. All right, so now we'll move on to the honey locust. Uh, the honey locust also has large bipinnately or pinnately compound leaves. So sometimes you see a bipinnately uh, compound version like here, um, and sometimes it's just pinnately compound um, on the same tree. Uh, but you're going to have very small oval leaflets uh, making up these large leaves. You'll also see long reddish brown seed pods um, that may twist with age, so they kind of can end up having a twirl, kind of like a helix, um, like a DNA strand. Uh, they also will have sharp thorns along the branches if it is a, um, a native uh, honey locust. Uh, there are some hybrid varieties that have been uh, developed that are thornless, um, which are commonly planted in cities. So most of the ones you see around here in Ann Arbor uh, may actually be the thornless varieties. So this species, um, along with several of the others that we've talked about actually, uh, including the Kentucky coffee tree, uh, they are legumes. Um, so they are actually related uh, pretty closely to plants such as peas, lentils, and soybeans. All right, so let's take a look at a honey locust here in Ann Arbor. Zoom in here um, to the Water Hill neighborhood. And here's our honey locust here. Uh, you can see it has a rather tall, straight trunk. And you can see that it has those very, very small leaflets making up the larger leaves. Um, so we'll move a little bit closer here and take a look up. And you can see those leaflets. Um, it looks very uh, kind of feathery from down here because of those small leaflets in that uh, pinnately or bipinnately compound arrangement. Okay, now uh, we have the sweet gum. So the sweet gum has kind of maple-like or star-shaped leaves um, that have five to seven lobes. Uh, they also have these spiny gumball-like fruits uh, that start off green and then turn brown in the fall. So I'm sure many of you have seen these fruits uh, laying on the sidewalk, these little spiky balls, and may have even stepped on a few of them and uh, hurt your foot a little bit because they are rather spiky. Um, so a fun fact about this tree, uh, there have been uh, fossil imprints of leaves from sweet gums just get, uh, discovered that have been dated as far back as the Cretaceous period. So these trees have been around for a very long time um, since back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, the hardened sap of this tree can also be used as a chewing gum, hence the name of the tree, sweet gum. So let's take a look at an example sweet gum here in Ann Arbor. We zoom in here to the Burns Park, Lower Burns Park area. We can take a look at this sweet gum here. Um, so you can see that it has a uh, relatively generic um, tree shape to it. Uh, if we move in a little bit closer and take a look at the leaves, you can see that kind of star shape to them, and you may see some of those uh, gumball fruits hanging off of there as well. All right, so now moving on to the tulip tree. So the tulip tree has very distinctive leaves. Uh, they have four lobes to them. Um, and a relatively flat top at the uh, end, away from the petiole. They also have large uh, cone-shaped seed clusters and showy tulip-like flowers, which are yellowish green in color, as you can see here, uh, this diagram of what the flower looks like. Uh, so this species is actually a member of the Magnolia family, and it's one of the largest tree species in North America. Um, it's an early successional species, which just means that it grows up really quickly through openings in the canopy. As soon as there is an opening, uh, seedlings of this tree will start growing there, and they grow very rapidly, very tall, very fast, um, so they can take advantage of that gap in the canopy and get up into it before other tree species can. So let's take a look at a tulip tree here in Ann Arbor. I'm gonna zoom in here again to near the Burns Park neighborhood. 
And you can see this tool tree is very tall. It has grown very tall very quickly, as I just mentioned, uh, due to its early successional um, strategy of growth. So if we take a look at it, it has that very tall, straight trunk. Uh, and if we zoom in a little bit, you may be able to see uh, the, that distinctive flat-topped, four-lobed uh, leaf shape of this relative of the magnolia. All right, moving on to the black willow. So the black willow has long, finely toothed leaves. So you can see these very long uh, kind of lamp-shaped leaves with fine toothing along the edges. Uh, the bark of the tree is often very furrowed and shaggy looking in appearance. Uh, and the branches may droop slightly, so it may look a little bit like a weeping willow, but it won't weep as much as a true weeping willow will. Uh, so a fun fact about uh, willows in general is that the main ingredient in aspirin, salicylic acid, is actually derived from a chemical called salicylin, uh, and that chemical is found in the bark of willow trees. Uh, and then specifically about black willows, uh, the wood from these trees uh, was once used for artificial limbs uh, because of its very light weight. All right, uh, so let's take a look at this very uh, medically helpful tree. Um, we'll zoom in here to the southern end of the city and take a look at a black willow. Um, so you can see it has that uh, droopiness that is kind of uh, looks like a weeping willow, but not as weepy as a true weeping willow would be. Um, but you can see those uh, very long uh, leaves uh, drooping off of the branches, and you can also see kind of behind them that shaggy furrowed bark that I mentioned as well. Moving on to the American yellowwood. So the yellowwood has oddly pinnate leaves. So you can see it has this, uh, the, the feathery shaped, um, a feathery looking uh, branch of leaves, uh, but they alternate from one another um, instead of coming off directly across from each other. So it is oddly pinnate. Um, the leaflets are oval shaped, um, forming this leaf. Uh, the bark of this tree is smooth and gray, it kind of has an elephant-like quality to it. It looks a bit like uh, the leg of an elephant. And uh, these trees also have drooping clusters of pea-like white flowers. Uh, so this species is highly tolerant of pollution, which makes it really good for urban environments. In fact, uh, it was named the Urban Tree of the Year in 2015 by the Society of Municipal Arborists. All right, so taking a look at an example of yellow wood here in Ann Arbor, we're going to move up here to the northeastern part of the city, north of the river. All right, and here's our yellow wood here. Uh, you can see they provide quite a bit of shade. They have that uh, large, dense canopy. Um, and if we look at the bark, you can see it is that smooth gray I mentioned. And then looking up at the leaves, you see those oval uh, leaflets. Okay, so the eastern red bud. Uh, has heart-shaped leaves, as you can see here. They can be kind of triangular um, sometimes, but generally they're more heart-shaped than is in this diagram. Uh, they also have long seed pods, which persist into the winter. Uh, but perhaps the most noticeable thing about these trees, at least in the spring, is they have these pink flowers that appear uh, directly off of the branches and twigs of the tree uh, in the month of May. Uh, those flowers are actually edible. They can be eaten fresh, uh, they can be fried, they can be boiled, lots of different preparations. Uh, and the green twigs from the tree uh, in early spring um, can be harvested, and those can also be used as a spice, uh, which has given the tree the nickname of Spicewood. So let's take a look at an eastern redbud here in Ann Arbor. We're going to go back to Burns Park again. Lots of trees in that neighborhood that are good examples of the species we can find. Uh, and here is a small little redbud. Um, so you can see those heart shaped leaves on this small tree, uh, as well as those seed pods um, that can be found uh, hanging off of it. 
All right, so moving on from our hardwood species to some of the, our coniferous or evergreen species. First, we have the eastern white pine. Uh, the eastern white pine has thin, soft, and long light green needles that come in bundles of five, which is one of the main ways to distinguish it from some of the yellow pine species we have in the area, which have two or three needles per bundle. Uh, the eastern white pine also has these long, slightly curved pine cones. Uh, the Haudenosaunee native peoples know the white pine as the Tree of Peace, uh, and it symbolized the creation of the League of Five Nations. Uh, these trees also have tall, straight trunks, which are prized for use as masts on sailing ships because they do not have very many curves to them. All right, so let's take a look at an eastern white pine here in Ann Arbor. If we move off to the western edge of the city, uh, we find an eastern white pine over here, uh, and there you can see that very tall, straight trunk, uh, and you can kind of see the fuzzy appearance that you get from those long, soft needles that we have on this tree. Uh, moving a little bit closer to get a better view of those needles, um, we can zoom in a little bit and you can see those long, soft bundles of needles. Again, those are in bundles of five. All right, uh, let's take a look at the white spruce. So the white spruce has short uh, four-sided, so they're kind of squarish needles rather than being rounded like you find on pine trees like the eastern white pine. Uh, and the needles on this tree are light or bluish green in color, um, sometimes a little bit similar looking to the uh, blue spruce, um, but generally a little bit less blue than those. Uh, the needles on the tree are off, also often clustered on the upper side of the branches. And you'll also see some small, thin cones that are clustered usually near the tops of the trees. Uh, so Jacques Cartier, the first European to see this tree species, actually described white spruces as the finest trees in the world. Uh, these uh, trees are also extremely tolerant of cold temperatures. They can survive temperatures as low as negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and they grow very far north up into uh, the tundra areas of Canada and Alaska. All right, so let's take a look at a white spruce here in Ann Arbor. Again, we're gonna go up to the northeastern edge of the city uh, and zoom in a little bit and take a look at our white spruce here. Um, so you can see it has a kind of pyramidal shape to it. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see those needles that come off of the branches individually and are kind of a whitish, bluish green color. All right, and our last tree of the virtual tree tour is the Eastern Red Cedar. So the foliage on this tree can be needle-like, so think kind of like the spruce or the pine, or scale-like, so think like scales on a snake. Um, but regardless of what uh, form it takes, uh, the foliage is kind of silvery green to green in color, uh, and it can actually kind of yellow a little bit in the winter. Uh, you'll see a peeling reddish bark on this tree, and also you will see on the females of this tree, because this is another dioecious species where you have male and female individuals, uh, the females produce bluish gray berry-like cones. Um, so these are actually cones, um, although they are called juniper berries. Uh, so the wood from this species is very durable and resistant to decay. Uh, so it's actually been used for lots of different things, um, everything f from bows, um, as in like bows and arrows, uh, to pencils. Um, were commonly made with wood from this tree. And those juniper berries that I mentioned um, from a related juniper species that actually grows uh, further west in the country are actually used to produce gin. All right, so let's take a look at our last tree on this virtual tree tour. We're gonna head up here to the garden homes at Abbott neighborhood area. And here is our eastern red cedar. So if we zoom in, you can see that reddish trunk uh, that has those uh, peeling uh, bits on it and kind of furrowed areas. Uh, and you can also see that scale or needle-like vegetation. All right, well, thank you all for joining me today on this virtual tree tour. I hope you are able to learn something and uh, see some cool trees along the way. And I hope you, uh, 
are excited about trees and want to get out there and take a look at some of these trees uh, in person and see if you can identify them. Um, if you have any questions about Tree ID, uh, this virtual tree tour, um, or anything offered by the 10,000 Trees Initiative, any of our programs that we offer, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at sreynolds at a2gov.org. And again, you can also visit our website at www.a2gov.org slash 10ktrees.